This episode of Six Five Guys is brought to you by Benchmark Barrels, world class accuracy. Defiance Machine, defying tradition with innovation. JC Steel Targets, the industry leader in quality AR500 steel targets. Welcome to Six Five Guys. I'm Steve Lawrence. And I'm Ed Mobley. We're wrapping up 2018 and what a year it's been. It has been. It has been. Uh, you know, I think some of our viewers are like, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, we, you know we, we, we haven't seen you uh, at a lot of matches. And, uh, you know, for, for me, for my day job, which, you know, pays for, for all the toys, uh, up to you know the beginning of the month of, of December, um, I had uh, traveled every week with the exception of, of three weeks, and, mm-hmm. and a lot of those trips were, were to the East Coast Monday through Thursday. And as you can imagine, you're you're just flat out tired. Yeah, weekend comes and yeah, you stuff you have stuff to take care of on the home front as well. Well, well, exactly. But it has been. Um, uh, you know, uh, on, on my property, I've, I've got a hundred yard range, so it has allowed me to do a lot more experimentation. So oh. instead of going out and, and doing the matches, I've actually been doing a lot of uh, R and D. Mm-hmm. And uh, later on in this video, we're going to answer some uh, viewer questions. And as a result of some of that R and D, uh, I, I feel that we can give uh, some much more informed answers because as mm-hmm. you can imagine yep. a lot of those uh, questions are around uh, load development that's right that's and right. Uh, and again you know it's a, it's it's not that I have a, a, a horrible employer it's just that I've had uh, some opportunities uh, some really good career opportunities to to build a practice but again uh, nothing nothing comes easy <laughs> and uh, so that's uh, you know that, that that's a choice I've made is is really focus uh, on really uh, an opportunity that doesn't come to a person uh, that often in, in, in their yeah. career. Yeah. And okay. 2019 though should, uh, should be a lot better because uh, I spent 2018 as, as, as chief cook and bottle washer to, to try and prove things out. But you know, now you know, we've got uh, about another uh, 20, 30 people uh, that we've uh, onboarded. So now I'll focus more yeah. <laughs> on, on you know, getting more of a well, leverage back, model. Back to our slogan, yeah. right? Life's an adventure, stay yeah, exactly. on target. Um, you've been targeting your career and, and that's been the focus. Um, you know, I've had a lot of different things in focus this year or, or, or last year. But um, you know, my situation is, you know, we, we went out to New Mexico and, mm-hmm. and, you know, I had a great outlook for the year, but again, similar to you, work ended up taking priority on, on a number of occasions. I, I haven't had um, quite the stress levels, I'm sure, as, as you have at, at work, but, you know, I have made it out to um, a handful of the local club matches here in the Northwest uh, that we run. And uh, I've noticed that the sport continues to grow. In fact, I was trying to get into the last match last month and um, didn't realize that you they've changed it now. You have to pay in advance. Oh, really? Yeah, PayPal, yeah. Okay. Well. And um, I, I wasn't aware of that until I was told that um, you're off the list because you didn't pay. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Okay. So I, now I know. So. All right. Well, 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 you learned that lesson. But but I think uh, you also have a video that we did with Brian Whalen because when we did do trips mm-hmm. in, in 2018, they were really some some high impact trips. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I'm not going to, you know, recap the, the video with Brian. I mean, you all can watch that. But that, to me, was was really one of the best experiences I've had. And it, it, it actually <clears throat> fed into some of the R&D uh, that I was uh, doing. And then, quite honestly, we had a real opportunity to give back to the community when uh, we did the home with heroes. The, the home with heroes. Right. Again, you can you can watch the video. We're not gonna we're not gonna recap it here. Right. So, um, all in all, I mean, it, I mean, I think it was a good year. It was just a a different, different year. Yeah, it was just a different year. But yeah. uh, again, for our. our, our core viewership uh, my sense is you know folks are kind of enamored uh, with what we do because 
you know, we're a couple of guys. <laughs> Just like you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, d d doing your thing. I mean, this is, uh, this is a, uh, a labor of love. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you got to do things so that you can uh, engage in that labor of love. That's right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about 2019. Um, we'll talk first kind of gear and, and rifles, what we might be doing differently. We Last year, of course, uh, we're shooting 6 by 47 uh, 110 Sierras. I pretty much um, have about 600 left of the 3,000. Yeah, I bought 3,000 uh, of those bullets. So pretty much shot out of barrel. So that rifle actually is at the gunsmith now getting rechambered to something different. Um, so I'll just go ahead and spill the beans here. I'm, I'm going six dasher. I'm going to try, oh, all try right. drink, drinking the Kool-Aid. All right. Um, Are you going to paint <clears throat> your rifle pink? Uh, <laughs> maybe. I know that's an old joke. But I got, yeah. um, let's see, 500 rounds of, of the Hydroform brass, um, the dies, and, and the rifle is at the gunsmith. Should be able to pick it up in February. So I'm looking forward to showing that off. It's actually... Um, the same rifle, the, the same match rifles last year, so really no changes. Um, you know, won't be any kind of big, exciting unveil for you guys, um, you know, when we talk about kind of the, the gear for next year. So there's that. And then the other thing I'm thinking about doing is, again, really factored on the trip to New Mexico with Brian. And I've been in, uh, on and off uh, touch with Brian um, over the year. And of course, many of you guys may have seen some of the videos he's done with Frank Galley of Sniper's Hide, uh, where they were shooting 224 Valkyrie. Um, talked to, to him a little bit about that experience. And our buddy, Gavin Gear, who runs the Ultimate Reloader, he's, he's done 224 Valkyrie and Bolt Rifle. And I'm pretty excited. I'm, I'm actually oh, gonna, I'm actually gonna gonna do it. Actually, I think for like a, an auto loading caliber especially when we were out there with mm -hmm. Brian and it just seemed effortless to just hit like a 600 yard plate in with an AR. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny cuz when I first heard bolt rifle 224 Valkyrie I was like, what's the point? Like, wait, I don't get it. And but after some discussions and I will go down that rats hole here, there is there is a use case for it, very specific, you know, shorter ranges like we do here locally. It'd be a right. great great club gun uh, for, for a match gun here for what we do. You know, if, you, if wind's not a huge factor, you know, most of your points are going to be inside six, 700 yards. It'll do just fine. Oh, I agree. I agree. So, very low, very low recoiling. Well, yeah, like, like as yeah. we saw with a very light AR platform, you, yeah. you have a very light recoiling yet extremely flat shooting car yeah. uh, caliber. Yeah. So now you've got some, tell us about your new development. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what I've decided to do, because it, it's also driven by uh, some of my time constraints, is I'm going with a, a complete system. And when I mean system, I'm talking system. So I am going to be shooting the, the Tub Adaptive Target Rifle in 6 xc the original 6 xc with the uh, Peterson uh, <coughs> Small Rifle Primer Brass. I will... Um, also be using uh, David Tubbs dies for the 6XE because there's some innovations that mm -hmm. he's done with both the, uh, the sizing die and the uh, seating die. I mean, he's, he's got videos on, on those and shooting the, uh, the 115 DTAC rebated uh, boat tail uh, bullets. It'll be a, mm -hmm. a seven twist barrel. And because quite, quite honestly, I do want to shoot some matches, but last year I, I found myself kind of fiddling around with the 6x47. I think the 7.5 twist rate didn't do him any favors with the, the Sierra 110s. And maybe that was it, but I wasn't necessarily thrilled. And I mentioned this in another video. You know, I think the 110s did okay, but they didn't perform as well as I had hoped they would. Right, right. And so part of the, and, and so Sierra says seven twist barrel on the box. And now I'm kind of realizing maybe there's a reason for that. Now, <laughs> there's some folks who say, oh, but you know, I've shot them in an eight twist or seven and a half twist. I don't doubt that, that folks have had good experiences with different mm -hmm. twists. My experience was just okay. Not, yeah, it just wasn't good. And I just yeah. didn't feel good about going to a match with something that really wasn't, uh, performing very well. And it kind of goes back to like shooting a system versus kind of 
experimenting. Yeah, I mean, you, you've you basically invested all in, 100% in, in the David Tubb solution. His, his system is what you're going with. Well, yes, because right so. now he's done a lot of the, the R&D. R&D. Exactly. Now, don't get me wrong. I enjoy experimentation, but it's just gotten to the point now where I want to shoot some matches and at least show up with a system that's going to work. Mm-hmm. And so I, I go back and, and look at when we were shooting this the 6.5x47. In that particular case, we were working with Arbro's rifles. He had a reamer. He had load data. He'd worked everything out. And if I, if I, think, if I look back over the last five years, I can't mm-hmm. believe it's been five years, the, I think it shot so well for us, and it was so trouble-free, because it was yeah, a system. And maybe that's why I got the idea that every gun does that. And it, they don't. No, they don't. They don't. And, and quite honestly, yeah. and, and it's the same thing with, uh, with, the, with the 308. Mm-hmm. And that's what I shot in April. Because, again, I, I was just frustrated with the 6x47. So I didn't take that out to, to New Mexico. It also helped me learn you can do a lot with a 308 shooting 175 grain match kings at 2600 feet per second and mm-hmm. you say well why 2600 feet per second because that is just a known accurate sweet spot for that particular bullet uh you know federal gold medal match which is you know if somebody you know like they say if you think your rifle's broken shoot some gold medal match if you can't make gold medal match shoot well you probably do have a problem either with mm-hmm. your rifle mm-hmm. or you but again, if, if I look back at the themes, the 308 was a well-known system. Yeah. The 6.5x47 was a well-known system. And again, you know, I talked with Chase Stroud, who's uh, shooting the, the Tub Adaptive Target Rifle. David Tubb, somebody that, uh, growing up, I followed his, uh, his exploits. And- yeah, and he, he's got some really innovative stuff. And for you guys that, uh, I know probably there's a number of you that um, are very interested in um, some of his innovations and the things that he's doing to kind of push the envelope of precision rifle. It'd be interesting to kind of follow yeah. your journey as you take that on. And he's 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 very he's been very approachable. I mean, literally, I, I swear right now, if I dialed him on my cell phone right now, he would he would pick up. Yeah, I mean, he's 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 that that kind of a guy. Now well, we're gonna but do. You're st- Ed Mobley, so <laughs> I'm. Uh, I'm <laughs> but, well, no, honestly, you know what? Yeah. We've been doing this for five years, and you yeah. know what? We, we do get some respect, and and it's it's a bit flattering and humbling that we can reach out to industry luminaries, and they will get back to us. And mm-hmm. honestly, uh, there I, I I think that that plays into it yeah. a bit. Uh, now we're going to do a separate video on the adaptive target rifle, as well as we will uh, uh, on on your uh, rifles. But again. There are just some things with it, also just ergonomically, because again, mm-hmm. you know, David Tubb, you know, historically has been yeah. A, yeah. a position shooter, and and so he needs right. a, a a system that's very fungible and adaptable and and adjustable. Yeah. So uh, so stay tuned uh, for that. So um, and then you know, I think we'll probably keep our calendar open for matches. I do, you know, personally want to get out to a lot more matches. Um, you know, I'll be signed up for um, PRS, NRL, one or both. Um, we'll see, but um, you know, I know a lot of matches now are starting to open up for registration. So now's the time to start picking which, which are the right dates that will fit. So um, hopefully I can get out to a lot more last year, which won't be too hard of a thing. But. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, I know in my um, case, yeah, it'll be like, uh, yeah, it'll be. We'll just see. A, we'll see. Just, a, just about anything. Um, hopefully, we, you know, I, I see some of you guys out there. If you if you do, make sure you reach out and say hi. So. Yeah, I know somebody on Facebook I posted the other day, and they said, oh, we thought you went into the witness relocation program. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if you see Ed's picture on a on a milk cart, uh, uh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna do something next here that you know we've talked about doing, uh, but now we're gonna do it. And it's like viewer mail. Yeah, you know, you know, again, we get a ton of email, and we try to stay on top of it as best we can. A lot of it slips through the cracks, and in fact, some questions. Um, they tend to follow the same type of pattern of um, you know very common themes, and then there's others that require a much more in-depth response. So we're not going to necessarily read through every single viewer, viewer email, but what we will do is 
really address a lot of the common questions and hopefully this addresses probably the <laughs> hundred or so that we haven't gotten around to answering some of the some of the <laughs> themes variations of it on a, on um, theme. and it's not it's not so much I don't I want you guys to make sure you understand that it's not that um, we don't want to answer it's we flat out um, just don't have the time uh, we have so many other things that we're tending to so but now now we're, we're, we're making some time here so so one one of the questions and, and thanks again Steve for for compiling uh, some of these one question is like okay for for larger cartridges now if you watch the uh, videos we've done with Scott Satterley you know he talked about doing 0.2 grain increments mm -hmm. and somebody said so what do you do when you have a a larger cartridge and uh, you know they've folks have posited so do we do like 0 0.4 0 0.5 grain increments in doing our uh, 10 round load development and the answer is yes absolutely mm -hmm. you would you would want to yeah do that yeah. I mean you could do 0 0.2 but as some people pointed out I mean <laughs> it, it's really going to be hard to do a 10 round uh, load development yeah just scale up proportionally so for example if your case capacity is 45 grains and and now you're shooting an 80 grain capacity cartridge yeah maybe it, instead of going 0.2 you go 0.4 or maybe 0.5 so I think that's totally appropriate again staying within the the safety bounds of what your load manual says now now another question folks have is say you're working in 0.2 increments and you find that nice flat spot is it okay maybe to go 0.1 above and below and see if maybe the it, it shoots a slightly better group or something like that absolutely nothing nothing wrong with that what what i've seen very interesting is i mean folks in benchress have been doing this for a while they they play with barrel tuners and and one of the things that i'm interested in playing around with with my tub adaptive target rifle is you know i've talked to, to chase stroud about this and so what he does is he he loads for a desired velocity so it will match his reticle mm -hmm. uh, given whatever the density altitude is going to be in the situation he's shooting so you're like well wait a second okay doesn't that kind of negate the whole finding that nice flat spot and stuff like that well, it, it doesn't because uh, David Tubb has this thing, it's called a, a tunable muzzle brake. So just like you might be going up and down by you know, 0.1 grain increments to just mm -hmm. really tighten that, tighten that group up, mm -hmm. instead, uh, and again, we'll do a video on this, he accomplished that, accomplishes that by moving this muzzle brake in and mm -hmm. out and and so as part of his his load development scheme what you do is is you load to that desired velocity and then in three turn increments you you you, you tune, tune the barrel yeah, yeah you you, you tune, literally tune the barrel yeah you literally tune the barrel now yeah. as a result the the threaded portion that that brake goes on is you know a couple inches long and it's three quarter inch thread so mm -hmm. if you want to use a suppressor you're either going to have to thread for that or, or or use some type of an adapter but i'm really i'm really looking forward to to playing around with that because again it, it comes down to keeping things really simple and when you read some of these emails i mean we relate to it it can be very frustrating trying to find <clears throat> that perfect load it can and, and again i'm gonna I, i've mentioned this in other videos and i'm gonna say it again here um for you guys that are interested in 10 round load development or maybe you've tried it and had issues we do get a number of questions around this doesn't seem to be working for me or i have questions as to why it's not working for me um oftentimes they don't provide a lot of details around that around what um, components they're using what their load development experience is have they been loading for a while do they consistently get low es single digit es in their loads those are very relevant important facts and our position is 10 round load development really is for a very well seasoned experienced reloader that can consistently get single digit es on their loads their precision loads and are using high quality components that are very consistent absolutely if, if, if you have neither of those we would not recommend this load development technique i think you'll find it very challenging and probably frustrating well and and the reason why a lot of the commercial ammunition offerings shoot so well you take something like uh, a federal gold medal match uh, as an example 
uh, 308. It shoots 175 grain Match King bullet at 2600 feet per second out of a 26 inch barrel. That is just a known, it just seems to be a sweet spot for everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I've tried to, you know, push the Match Kings faster, but the results sometimes aren't that consistent. But if I just, if I just want something that I know is going to work, I do that. Same thing with 6.5 Creedmoor, the, the 140, I think it's a Hornady match. Again, mm -hmm. it shoots really, really well. But is it, you know, pushing the envelope as far as velocity? No. But as you saw from that video when we were out in New Mexico with 175 grain match kings going 2,600 feet per second, I was shooting a thousand yard target. Yeah. So it works. Now, why did I mention that? If you're, if you're a beginner and you're reloading, what I would suggest you do is just use well-known combinations for your particular bullet and uh, your, your particular cartridge. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's really easy to look up. Yeah, I, I think the main objective, particularly if you're new to reloading, um, you know, perhaps in the, you're in the first few years of reloading or um, starting to really get into precision ammo reloading, your primary objective would be trying to get very low ES and SDs. Um, consistency, be a very consistent reloader. Once you've mastered that, then you can start exploring some of these more advanced techniques like 10 round load development. Yeah, and, and, and another thing that, that we've both observed is one rifle that we both have that just seems to be just a consistent tack driver is 6.5 by 47. Well, that, but oh. also our, our trainer. Oh, yeah, the 223, yeah. yeah. Right, but, but here's the thing with that the That was two, a no-load. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, but here's the interesting thing with, with, with the 223. Uh, again, we, our bros built those, those rifles for mm -hmm. us, you know, um, and we were using uh, the, the bullets uh, were the, the... The Hornady 75 grain boat tail hollow point. Exactly, but here's the thing. When we loaded for that, because we wanted to be a high volume practice rifle, we're using like mixed head stamp, Lake City brass. <laughs> we're using like a powder thrower. Yet that it's rifle, a tack driver. it is a tack driver. Yeah. It's almost like you cannot screw it up. And so as I do this more and more, and as I've been experimenting, there's an old saying, 90% of accuracy is bullets and barrels. And, and I'm really starting to believe that. Mm -hmm. And so some of these questions, for example, people ask, well, should I neck turn? Or, or people spend a lot of time uniforming their primer pockets and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And honestly, there's a reason why a lot of folks in, in this sport don't do that because if there are any benefits, they're de minimis. Mm -hmm. It's and for most shooters, they wouldn't notice it on paper. So it, 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 yeah. exactly. So I would suggest, particularly for for the newer shooter, use you know, I, I again like the old saying, bullets and barrels. You know, make sure you use an, a known bullet. Don't necessarily start with like the latest. Uh, super high BC bullet because it, it sure it may have like a high BC but it'll take time for people to really understand you know is that really an inherently mm -hmm. accurate bullet yeah yeah so find out what other folks are using what they recommend um, you know that's consistent uh, why don't we move on to load analysis yes so as many of you may be aware uh, middle of last year I actually had created a, a load analysis video as well as a brand new spreadsheet model in Excel. And I've actually walked through step by step how to use that tool to do load analysis and actually explain a lot of statistical concepts that are pretty important to understand. So you actually kind of understand what it is you're doing and why you're doing it, um, where, how to analyze the data you're collecting over a chronograph and so on. So I would highly recommend if you're doing load analysis and have questions around, okay, I've collected this data, what do I do with it? I'm not sure how to read the graph. Please watch that video. I know we get a lot of questions um, from viewers that are sharing their data and asking us to interpret it. We'd love to help. We flat out just don't have the time, um, but we have given you guys the tools to actually do that, to do that yourselves. And I would encourage you to take the time pick up the model it's free we don't charge anything for it and, and actually have uh, some tools out there to help just say nice things to Steve and that's that's, <laughs> that, that, that's payback enough but re re related to your analysis we've had a lot of people say okay so so I I, I do my 10 round string mm -hmm. and then you know just for belt and suspenders purposes I do maybe a second or a third string and then they say 
They don't match. They don't match. And, yeah. and so they said, well, is, is this approach valid? But the reason why I've got my laptop here is I, I was showing Steve that I, I shot successive 10 shot strings and you know, I laid them on top of each other in a spreadsheet. I mean, we'll, he'll show it here in, in, in the video in like a cutout or something like that. Basically what happens is you, the, the variances or the differences between your three strings tend to occur in areas that are above and below mm -hmm. the optimal charge weight. Yeah. But in the area of the optimal charge weight, and I did this for both, I was playing around with some 155 CNRs on my 308 and some, and the 175 grain uh, match kings. Because I first observed it with the 155 CNRs, is it they all seem to cross. Yeah, once you get to a flat point, they start to converge. They, they, they all start to converge, yeah. even though above and below that, mm -hmm. you, you may think that maybe there's you know, some variability or, or stuff like that. Yeah. And the reason why I, I, I also did it again with the 175 grain match king is I wanted to see if it was repeatable. And I know this is kind of a limited uh, experiment, but it, it, it did the same thing. Now, uh, the, the 175 grain match kings, for example, had less variability with each 10 shot string, but they're mm -hmm. still there, but it's still converged, yeah. you know, <laughs> it, right, right at 2,600 feet per second. Right. It's, like, it's like uncanny. And then with the 155 uh, CNRs, uh, it, it converged at a velocity just right around uh, 2950. Uh, but mm -hmm. the, the 155 CNRs from string to string, you know, did have more variability above and below. But again, it, it all converged uh, yeah. around the optimal so again, charge weight. So um, again, as you collect more data, right? Yeah. The more data you collect, the better information you'll have upon which to make a decision around where that optimal. Uh, load is exactly so so the lesson for me is that uh, you know based on 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 this information I feel completely confident shooting a a single 10 shot string because that flat spot there mm -hmm. I know now if I were to shoot another 10 10 shot string mm -hmm. They they yeah. they tend to convert. But again, I want to emphasize: you're a very experienced reloader. Oh yeah, you're using yeah. consistent components. Yes, right. Um, so I think you've mastered that consistency. So the data you collect, you can pretty much rely on to make make a decision. Now here's another question somebody was asking, and I, I just observed this recently. We for a long time uh, you, we we favor a small rifle primer brass. It's just consistent. And you know we've been shooting the CCI 450 Magnum mm -hmm. primers, but you all can search around in the internet, and and you'll know one manufacturer's small rifle Magnum primer may be hotter or cooler than another manufacturer's mm -hmm. Magnum primer. And so what I've what what I came across is when I was playing around with my 308, I'm using the Lapua uh, Palma brass, and so at uh, my optimal weight with you know with H4895 and the 175 Match Kings is like uh, it's 40.6 grains. It, it gives me 2,600 feet per second. But I had two situations a couple months apart in cold weather where I got a misfire. And so naturally I thought, well maybe maybe I was in a hurry. I didn't put powder in there. But when I took it apart, the powder was in there, but it was yellow and clumped and it had kind of a, a burnt smell to mm -hmm. it. And so I, I did some research and sure enough, I've, I saw other folks who, who basically have experienced issues with incomplete ignition mm -hmm. when, when your primer isn't hot enough. So as a result in, in, in uh, the Remington seven and a half bench rest small rifle primers are hotter. And so that was an interesting learning where mm -hmm. uh, for, for some of the larger cartridges where yeah. you're maybe only doing 95% fill and maybe that powder mm -hmm. isn't right jammed up against the, the primer, primer there. Yeah. So I just mentioned that because some of the, you know, there was one uh, person here who was using CCI 450 in, in a larger uh, case and he was just getting some real variability. Mm -hmm. And at least what I've noticed is with 308, uh, like 95% case fill on a cold day where maybe you know the powder might be pushed forward away from the primer you can you can actually get yeah. some just outright misfires mm -hmm. where the primer goes off 
the powder partially ignites or you just start you just get some real variability yeah so and again of course this just comes back to just using those known combinations uh, david tubb for example in the 6xc uses the remington seven and a halfs and i didn't ask him specifically but i surmise it's because it's just a a, hotter, a, 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 a little little hotter because mm -hmm. again you know you've, you've got that that small uh, rifle primer yeah so I mention it in that if if you if you're just getting frustrated, you're getting some really uh, variable results. It could be that because we had uh, one viewer here who said, "Yeah, I had this one cartridge, and you know, in the in the ten shot string that was off by like eighty feet mm -hmm. per second, mm -hmm. and he was using CCI four fifties. Yeah. Again, maybe that's it. Maybe it isn't. Or I've experienced that before, where I erroneously grab you know the mm -hmm. wrong cartridge or whatever yeah. and then uh, of course I, I quickly uh, realize the error so uh, you know don't don't be too constrained with a a particular combination of components especially if uh, you're not duplicating a, a, a well-known mm -hmm. combination yeah let's change the topic on some of the viewer questions a little bit just around kind of general questions of gear new shooters that actually want to get into PRS or NRL, they're not sure you know, what caliber. Um, I just had a question, I believe last week, um, somebody in Ireland wasn't sure if they should go 6547 or 65 Creedmoor. Uh, I know we share a common view around mm -hmm. that, around newer calibers, two shooters. Do you want to tell folks what that is? Well, I think in, in 6.5, again, it comes down to do you want to reload or not? If you don't want to reload, I mean, 6.5 Creed more is a new 308. Yeah. It's just hard. Right. I mean, it just it just works. You can, yeah. you know, that Hornady 140 grain match. Great, great bullets, just great brass. Great. Or prime ammunition. I mean, they've mm -hmm. got super accurate uh, stuff. But if you want to reload and you really want to tune it, Lapua, in conjunction with other luminaries mm -hmm. in the industry, they spent a lot of time creating a super efficient, super inherently accurate cartridge. Yeah. So if I reloaded, I would do I would go with a 65 by uh, by 47. And again, you know, there's an argument of should I go 65 or 6? Again, an, another very valid question. I think 65 would probably, you know, if you're pushing a, a good size bullet like a 140 pretty fast, you'll actually do better in the wind versus a 6 in many cases, particularly like a 6 dasher. Um, I didn't make it to the finale this year, but I understood guys shooting six Dasher versus other fellows that were shooting like a six Creed that can push that bullet faster. Um, six Dashers were, <laughs> those guys were getting crushed in, but, in the wind, so. But for some of the, so just like the six five by 47 is, is such an inherently accurate cartridge, so is the, mm -hmm. the six Dasher. It is. <coughs> yeah, it's supposed to be very inherently accurate. And very easy to reload for. And, <coughs> and long barrel life, mm -hmm. and, and so that's the reason folks gravitate toward that. Yeah. But you know, if you're maybe out in Oklahoma and you're, you know, a lot of your shots are out at 900,000 plus. Yeah, a 10 mile uh, per hour crosswind. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe Maybe six dashers yeah. is, you know, maybe you'd want to look at, again, I see a lot of people taking interest in the 6XC because, again, that's been mm -hmm. around. Yeah. For a newer shooter, David Tubbs, you know, 39.5, H4350, Remington 7.5, Peterson, perhaps 115. I mean, it, it, it's just going to work, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but then some of the, our friends have you know we've seen them go from everything from you know uh, a, a 6.5 mil caliber down to six kind of play around and then come back, back to six five yeah, yeah come come back to six five now i haven't seen anybody necessarily you know go all the way back to 30 cal yeah. unless they specifically want to shoot but again i would there. say um if you're new to the game um it's tough to beat six five especially six yeah. five creed more yeah uh, if you're looking Particularly it's an off, off the shelf rifle, you don't have a lot of money to spend on a custom gun. I would go 6.5 Creed more, um, you know, pick up a Bergara or something like that. Well, and you're, or, you're off to the races. Or, or you know, a Tika, Tika yeah. T3, you there know, you go. their yeah. magazine. There's a lot of good options yeah. out there. And and again, as, as I saw in New Mexico, I wanted to shoot the 6x47, six, six but I was getting ready to twist that rifle into a pretzel. So I went out there with my 308, and, I, and, and again, I was 
once you know just a known load with a high quality rifle mm -hmm. and, and I didn't feel that you know I, I was uh, I wasn't able to enjoy that experience or or, or get or, or derive a benefit from uh, from Brian's uh, instruction mm -hmm. now would I want to go up against a six mil shooter with a 308 no but I guess what I'm saying is for a newer shooter if what you have is a 308 just shoot some yeah. high quality loads yeah. and especially local matches you'll be fine mm -hmm. and the recoil management you'll learn about recoil management as well absolutely absolutely all right um, any other kind of common theme questions that I can think of um, Nothing comes to mind, but um, so so there's some questions about erratic flyers, and so we've personally observed where if you've got like a really soft bag and you're really having to squeeze it, that's going to induce mm -hmm. vertical flyers particularly. And then there's uh, there was one uh, uh, audience member here who said. Well, he takes his bullets and he dips them in graphite before he loads them. I, I've never done that. I don't assume it causes a problem, but if you're getting vertical stringing, doing something that, honestly, I haven't run into a lot of folks that do I'm that, a, maybe stop doing that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a big fan of consistency. How do you know you're consistently, diff it's like, well, yeah, I'm consistently coating the bullet? Well, well that's just uh, it. You know, it's the old Henny Youngman joke. It's like, doctor, it hurts when I do this. Well, don't do that, right? <laughs> so, so, so again, you, you've got because everything else this person was doing just seemed spot on. Mm -hmm. But then, just what caught my eye was like, you know, he was like dipping the bullets in graphite. Yeah. And again, not knowing. Stop doing that. So, <laughs> well, not not knowing not, how they're doing or it or why or why he's doing it. Right. Um, well, I mean, there's. Yeah, there there's a article. Actually, Paul McMiniman had an accurate shoot mm -hmm. back in 2008 about this guy Froggy that makes these crazy, crazy, repetitive five shot groups of this 308. That's yeah. literally one hole, and he lubed his bullets. Mm -hmm. And so maybe somebody ran into that. Again, I'm just surmising. Oh, uh, one other question, uh, theme of questions that we get. Mandrel dies. Oh yeah. Let's talk. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about mandrel dies. What types of mandrels should you get? Yes. Um, recommendations on you know stainless steel versus the carbide. Yes. Uh, yes. Do I go with neck turning versus a sizing? Yes. So don't 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 neck turn. You're, you're not going to get any advantage. It's just going to take a whole lot of time. Uh, none of the shooters that we know neck turn. A few, but not many. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so, so going back to the mandrel, I prefer the, the carbide mandrels because you, you don't have to lube them. Now they are more expensive. And you say, well, why, why do you care about lubing them? Because you're, you're gonna have lube in your neck after the sizing operation, mm -hmm. that's true. But what I also like to do is, uh, you know, after I clean off all the lube and everything and prime, and char and, uh, prime it, uh, Scott Satterley taught me this is, I run it over the mandrel again uh, prior to charging the powder and seeding the bullet because it has a, a couple of things. It, you know, if there are any little dings or irregularities mm -hmm. or whatever, it, it takes them out. Right. Occasionally, maybe for whatever reason, you forgot to run it over the mandrel in the first mm -hmm. time. So it's like kind of a, a, a belt and suspenders thing. Yep. And I've just noticed in doing that, I just consistently, I mean, my run out is is the best it, it has ever but, so been. you're using carbide neck the, the neck turning mandrels yeah, yeah yeah so so basically it's two thou under so what it does is it gives you two thou neck tension mm -hmm. now somebody might say oh two thousand that's the devil's work you should do one 1 1.5 well that's fine but you're not going to get a at least from sinclair you're going to have to go with one of their stainless uh, mandrels and you're only going to be able to use it or at least, at least use it without wearing it out if, if you loop. Mm -hmm. So um, I found uh, 2000 neck tension when we were shooting the 6.5x47, you know, brought the SDs and ESs down, mm -hmm. you know, just a scotch. I mean, yeah. it was one of a number of things that we did. So, so that's how I roll. Um, I read, even read an article too about uh, David Tubb where he uses a, a mandrel as well. And now if you've got a single stage, uh, 
it's an extra step and, and maybe you want to use the expander button that, that comes with your sizing. I'm night. using single stage and I, I do the mandrel process. Oh, you do? Yeah, so it, it's is, it is a separate stage. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I, but I load on a 550, so it's four operations for every pull of the handle. So mm -hmm. if you're, if you're look, I mean, honestly, my opinion is if you're loading on a progressive like a 550, yeah, I'd use the mandrel because yeah. I, I I believe their benefits, yeah. and I, I'd use carbide. Yeah, and again, these are the the Sinclair mandrel die. That's, that, Sinclair. that's what we're talking about. Now there are other mandrel manufacturers who will give you custom mandrels in carbide or stainless steel. So if you want to do, if if you firmly believe that one and a half thou neck tension is a way to roll, mm -hmm. and you want a, a carbide uh, mandrel, there are there are folks out there that will. Uh, uh, customize them yep. so but two two thou is, has has worked okay. pretty well yeah pretty well yep. i think you use like one and a half because you're using the stainless steel right or are you using carbide? i'm using stainless steel okay yeah okay yeah i okay. actually may go carbide this year all right well we don't want to drag the video out too long um any kind of parting thoughts before we wrap up oh this is this is okay. uh, uh I, Good year. Looking forward to the next one. Yeah, and and again, the uh, our audience, uh, just you know, from the comments, mm -hmm. we can see that there are folks out there that really appreciate what we do, and as a result, mm -hmm. we we appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks for growing the, uh, you know, our, our, our subscription numbers, letting us know that that this endeavor is worthwhile. Right. Um, so yeah, we're we're plugging away. Um, you know, we're still on the journey. Um, still love, very much love the sport. Appreciate your guys' encouraging feedback, the fact that you're, you're watching the video. Um, be sure to share it with friends. Tell, tell folks um, you know, about kind of what we do, and you know, they might be turned on by the content. So, Absolutely. Well, remember, folks, life's an adventure. Stay on target. <laughs>